Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23 is our text. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 16. And while this past week was Vacation Bible School week, this coming week, beginning uh, this evening, is the Southern Baptist Convention. And many of you are aware of that, and uh, you have been talking about that. In fact, I played in the golf tournament on Friday, and the first question I was asked when I arrived by my teammates concerned who I intended to vote for at the Southern Baptist Convention for president. So people are talking about it because it's in the news. In fact, we will be sending myself and Tracy and then Scott and Aaron are going as well. So the four of us will be your messengers. That's what we call those who have been selected by their church as voting members at the convention. We call them messengers. So the four of us will be your messengers to the convention. And as of this morning, there are 17,000 plus registered as messengers, which is double what is normal for the Southern Baptist Convention over the past two decades. This is going to be the largest attended convention since 1995. And the reason for that is a multitude of reasons, but a large part of it is because there are so many things that we are dealing with, so many things that are in the news. And so I want to remind you, not to believe everything you read in the news. All you're going to hear this week is the negative. You're going to hear what we are divided over, and there is plenty of that. We are divided theologically in many ways, and some are charging others with slipping into liberalism, going back again several decades and saying, we're on the same trajectory that we were several decades ago. You're going to hear that kind of stuff. You're going to hear that we are divided politically. And by that, I do not mean uh, a national politics, that is Republicans and Democrats, though that's part of it. What I'm talking about is we are divided as a convention politically, as in who has the political power and how are they going to get it for those who don't have it. We are divided practically. That is, there are some practical outworkings of what we believe that are causing divisions in our convention. And as a result, we have four different men who are running for the presidency this year, which is highly unusual, and that's another way in which we are divided. So you're going to hear all of that this week, but not hear the reports of all the rest of the things that the convention is doing on a positive note. So just be aware of that. And by the way, if you'd like to know what's going on firsthand, and you have nothing better to do on Tuesday and Wednesday... You can watch live. SBCAnnualMeeting.net is the place to go where you can watch the entire convention all day, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Tonight is the beginning of the pastor's conference. All day tomorrow is the pastor's conference, but the official convention is just two days, and that will be Tuesday and Wednesday. Now, I want you to understand a couple of things. Nothing, in one sense, nothing the convention does this week has any direct bearing on this church whatsoever. You say, well, how can that possibly be true? If it's the Southern Baptist Convention and we are a Southern Baptist church, how can it have no bearing on us? Well, it's because we believe in the autonomy of the local church. That is, the Southern Baptist Convention cannot tell us what to do. The only power they have as a convention over us is to kick us out of the convention if they don't like what we're doing. They cannot come into the local church and tell us anything that we are to do. On the other hand, everything that happens at the Southern Baptist Convention this week will impact our church. You say, well, how can that be true? You just said it doesn't. How can it be that it does? Are you being a politician now and speaking out of both sides of your mouth? No, I mean that it does have a direct bearing in the sense that the perception of what a Southern Baptist is has a tremendous influence on what this community thinks about us and other Southern Baptist churches and therefore whether or not people will actually come to our church. You see, there is the perception that if we're fighting in Nashville this week over all of these various issues, then the local church must be full of fights as well and I want nothing to do with that. And so what takes place in Nashville and what people read about in the newspapers or see on television does impact our church because they just might not come because they think we are all those things. As we say sometimes, perception is often reality. We have been dealing with this letter of Colossians, and this letter deals, like many New Testament letters, with false teachers and false teaching. 
And the verses we are looking at this morning are the heart of the controversy in that church. That is, these are the verses that explicitly, as far as we know, that explicitly deal with the false teaching that is going on. And so I don't want you to think that these verses are just dealing with ancient heresies. I want you to understand that everything we see in these verses is still very prevalent in our own churches today. The specifics might differ, and I'm going to try to explain that, but the philosophy behind it is still the same. And that is why we need discernment. As I read in just a moment, you're going to see in verse 23 the phrase, they have an appearance of wisdom. And that's why we need discernment. Some don't see heresy anywhere. That is, they readily digest anything that comes along. As long as a preacher or a teacher is quoting the scriptures occasionally, whether they're using that scripture accurately or not doesn't matter as long as they are quoting it or roughly talking about it, then they believe whatever it is they say. Others, on the other hand, see heresy everywhere. Everyone is a heretic that does not believe exactly as I believe on every single issue. All tiers, rather than just the first tier of doctrine, is now serving to divide people in our convention, and the name-calling begins. If you disagree with me on even one point of doctrine, whatever that point might be, then now you are a heretic and I am the spiritual one. Attacking fellow believers due to differences of opinion on these secondary matters is now way more common than it ought to be. So I am not advocating heresy hunters on the one hand that sees heresy in everything, Neither am I saying that we ought not to see it at all and digest everything that comes in the name of Christianity. I'm saying last week, Paul says, beware. There are some things you need to see and beware of. And then this week, he takes it a step further, and he says, not only must we beware of these things, but we must be careful that we not embrace them, because if we do, we are likely to be disqualified from the faith. Last week, beware. This week, disqualified. You know I I watch a lot of golf. Golfers can be disqualified on the PGA Tour for merely signing their name to a wrong scorecard. If any one of the scores of those 18 holes is wrong and they sign their name to the card, they are immediately disqualified from the entire tournament. And what I'm saying to us this morning is we must be careful. We must beware that we don't become disqualified by signing our name to a false theology. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you. That's where I get my title. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you have died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Again, like last week, I'll be honest with you, these are difficult verses. And I'm going to explain in a little bit why they are so difficult. So I'm not going to go phrase by phrase and absolutely explain everything that is here, but we are going to look at three forms of spirituality here that if we embrace them, 
It will disqualify us from the faith. And I want you to understand by disqualify, I do not mean that you will lose your salvation. We do not believe that is possible. But what I mean by that is if you run to one of these things and embrace them, you will be disqualified in the sense that you will have proven that your salvation was never genuine. So this is a very important issue this morning. The first word in our text is the word therefore, which of course points us back to what we looked at last week. And it helps us to understand that what we are talking about this week flows from that which we dealt with last week. Again, last week was look out, beware, watch out for. That is, we are to watch out for spiritual captives, capture. That is, those who would come along with a false theology and capture us with that false form of spirituality. We are going to look at these things this morning, not from the sense of just the ancient perspective, but hopefully from a contemporary model as well. So here the idea is not just that we be on the lookout for it, but we not allow others to judge us. Verse 16, do not let others judge you. And then verse 18, do not be disqualified on the basis of these things. Now, if we are to look out for others judging us on the basis of these things, then we can rightly turn that around and say to ourselves, we must not judge others on this basis either. It works both ways. Judging is a very popular idea these days. I've told you before that, in my opinion, John 3.16 is no longer the most popular verse in the Bible. I think it's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Or actually just the first half of Matthew 7 and verse 1, where it seems like everybody knows at least half of that verse. That verse says, judge not, lest you be judged. That's like the, the motto of the world now. You can't judge because Jesus said not to judge, which is a verse that is taken out of context because Jesus does not, does not say there that we are not to judge absolutely. He goes on to argue that we are to judge in a correct manner. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The truth is we make judgments all the time. We make judgment as to whether a potential pastor is fit for the position in the church. In one sense, you make a judgment about that continually. Is he still fit for leadership in the church? In just a few weeks, we'll begin the process of electing deacons to serve our church. And in that process, you are being asked to judge whether a particular man is fit for the office of a deacon. I certainly hope you are teaching your young people to judge the merits of a potential mate. The Bible does not prohibit appropriate judgments. It simply occur, encourages us to judge in the right manner. And the wrong way is on externals. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. All of the things we are going to talk about this morning are all going to be external forms of religion devoid of the internal reality of the heart. And the first one is that we can be disqualified through legalism. Now, before I go any further, I, I do want to make one matter very clear. When I say that legalism focuses on a set of do's and don'ts, I do not mean to imply that there are no such things. There is no doubt that a reading of the Bible says there are some things we are not to do. Thou shalt not lie or cheat or steal or murder. These are very clear things that we are to avoid. There are other things in the Bible that it is very clear we are to do. That is, we are commanded to read God's Word and obey it. We are commanded to pray. We are commanded to share our faith. We are commanded to love one another and be kind and patient, and on and on it goes. These are all injunctions in the Word of God that we are to either avoid or to follow. So the point I'm making is not the abolishment of all standards so that we can say we are free to do whatever it is we want to do. If that's what you get out of this sermon, that all of these external things are nothing and we can live however we want, then you have not heard me and you have certainly misunderstood what Paul says not only about legalism, but about the other things we will deal with as well. The point is simply this. Obeying the rules and laws established by God in his word or adding other man-made rules to them are not the way to make, be made right with God. 
We know that salvation comes by grace through faith without any mixture of works. And this is the key. When we are saved by grace through faith, we then joyfully obey God. Not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. That is, he has changed our heart and our desires, and therefore we desire to follow him. So obedience is certainly a major issue, but obedience does not make us right with God. In verses 16 and 17, Paul continues his attack on these false teachers who are attempting to lead the Colossian Christians astray. Prior to this point, he has largely been doing this on theological grounds, but theology, as I've said often, invariably leads to our practice, and now he is talking about their practice. These legalists are charging them in two basic ways, two areas, diet and days. And both of these, he says, are based on shadowy issues. In other words, they were looking at their spiritual lives and they were concluding that they were not all they needed to be based on external observations of whether or not they are obeying certain rules. And largely these rules were not ordained nor established by God, but rules that were made by men. That is, they were traditions. We don't know what all of these rules were. We don't have all of that information, but Paul does seem to cite several of them. He says that the legalists were judging based on food and dietary issues. Now, as you know, in the Jewish religion, diet was very, very important. That is, there were rules about how meat had to be be prepared in order to be eaten. It had to be killed in a certain way, the blood had to be taken care of a certain way, and it had to be prepared in a certain way. And of course, there were certain kinds of meat that were off limits all together, particularly pork. When we went to Israel a few years ago, there were no bacon bits on the salad bar. They just didn't have them because they didn't eat them there. Pork was against their religion. And so, as we've said, one of the biggest issues when Christianity came along was the, the, the welding together of these Jewish laws into Christianity. That is, how much of a Jew did you have to become, if at all, in order to be made right with God? And apparently the Colossian false teachers said these regulations regarding food and drink were still in force. And they were trying to enforce them and have the believers strictly follow them. And if you did not, then your standing with God was suspect. But did Jesus have anything to say about this? He certainly did. On one occasion, a group of Pharisees, who just happened to be the epitome of religious men who followed their own traditions rather than the will of God, they saw the disciples of Jesus eating with dirty or unwashed hands. The Pharisees followed the tradition of the elders that they did not eat unless they washed their hands in a specific manner. Now, again, hear me correctly, this was not a matter of hygiene. This was not a matter of trying to avoid a virus. This was a matter of ceremonial law. That is, you had to do these things in order to be pleasing to God. And so they saw the disciples ignoring these man-made laws, and they asked Jesus about it. Jesus, in turn, brought up some much more important commands that they were not following. And then he said, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That is the old charge by the prophet Isaiah against the people that they were doing the external things, but not from an internal reality. Jesus says this was true of the Pharisees. He went on to say that their defilement does not come by what goes into the mouth, but what comes out. And the disciples, as so often the case, did not understand what Jesus was talking about, and so they asked him for further explanation. And he said this, the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. It is from that which is within, the heart, that is our innermost being. When that comes out, that's what shows whether or not someone is defiled, not the food and drink that someone puts in their mouths. Peter famously had to be shown a vision three times to be taught that all animals were clean. And at first, he refused to eat when told to do so because he said, I've never eaten anything that was unclean. And then later on, he seems to have backtracked on that and had to be confronted by Paul. 
uh, the Jewish council in the book of Acts took up the same debate and formally ratified their decision and that the followers of Christ did not have to abide by these Old Testament dietary laws in order to be made right with God. Now, we don't really debate clean and unclean foods anymore, but that doesn't mean we've conquered legalism when it comes to even dietary issues. I told you at the beginning, these, these things are still ongoing, though they might manifest in different ways. But even in diet, we still have this debate sometimes. Uh, the vegetarians these days are, are becoming more visible and vocal. And there's nothing wrong with being a vegetarian. I am not one, and I have no desire to be one. But there's nothing wrong with if you choose to be a vegetarian. But if you choose to be a vegetarian and then look down your nose at everybody else who is not, pretending that they are somehow less spiritual than you because they choose to eat meat, then you have waded over into the realm of legalism and are continuing a first century heresy. Now, we won't talk about drink too much this morning. The Old Testament does not prohibit drink. That is any kind of drink. I mean, there's no prohibition in the Old Testament about anything they're drinking. And so what, what, what does this say about drink here? In all likelihood, this is the idea that wine was used in the uh, idolatry. And we see this debate throughout the rest of the New Testament. Is it okay to eat meat that had been, had been sacrificed to idols? Is it okay to drink wine that had been a participant in an idol worship? And so that's probably the idea here when it talks about both food and drink. This could be also an issue here with days, of course. I said it is drink and uh, food and drink, dietary issues and days, and that is the issue of the Sabbath and all of the other festival days. Again, you know that the Jews had very serious religious festivals along with the strict observance concerning the Sabbath. And again, if I might go back to our time in Israel about four years ago, if I remember correctly, we came into Jerusalem on a, on a Friday evening which means the Sabbath was about to begin, sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And so our, our guide, who was born and raised in Jerusalem, began to share with us that there were going to be some differences in what we experienced on the Sabbath. There were going to be less food offered because they didn't want to make people work to prepare the food. But the thing I remember the most is the elevator situation in our hotel. She said there, there is a separate elevator for Gentiles on the Sabbath. What's the reason for that? Well, the Jewish elevators in the hotel automatically on the Sabbath stop at every floor. You say, why? Because it's work to push a button. And so you weren't allowed to push a button to stop on the floor. So in order to avoid working on the Sabbath, the elevators were programmed just to stop on every floor. So if you didn't want to stop on every floor, you need to get it on the Gentile elevator so you can stop on whatever floor you want to stop on. And this is just one example of all kinds of rules about diet or days that were instituted and continue to be instituted. And you say, well, I'm sure glad we don't do anything like that. But we do. Remember, I told you at the beginning, I want to try to help us see that it's not just some ancient heresy, but these things manifest. Legalism is alive and well. It just manifests itself in, in other ways. Let me give you an example. Am I more spiritual because I wear a suit on Sunday mornings? More spiritual than someone who wears jeans? Of course not. That's external. Now, I know there are other issues here, and you say, well, there's a principle of this, or there's a principle of that, and we don't have time to get into all that. I'm simply trying to show you that there are contemporary manifestations of these same things, whereby we make conclusions about the spirituality or holiness or relationship of God of somebody else based merely on external observation. They can't be as spiritual as me because they don't dress as nice as I do. And that's the same thing we're seeing here in this text. All of these things, a, a shadow of the reality and a shadow of course is uh, nowhere near the substance and so Paul says all of these things were shadows they anticipated a day in the future when the substance would arrive effectively doing away or completing the shadow and that substance is of course Jesus Christ meaning that these shadowy things are no longer necessary and yet legalists continue to judge spirituality based on these things now again, keep in mind, and this, is, this can be so confusing, keep in mind that Paul does not forbid dietary discipline. He does not forbid the observance of religious festivals or the observance of the Sabbath. 
He is simply saying here, don't judge someone based on their spirituality or based on these elements and make a conclusion about their spirituality. So I wonder how often we do that. I wonder if we're willing to admit that we do that. That we look at external rules and external regulations, often extra biblical. That is, you can't really find them in the Bible, though you think you do. And it's merely a tradition of men, the way we were raised, of the culture in which we live. And we judge everyone's spirituality based on these things. Now, I also want you to understand, I'm not going to deal with it this morning because it's not in the text, but I do want you to understand that the opposite of all three of the ones we're going to look at is also something that can, can cause us a problem and disqualify us. So what's the opposite of legalism? Antinomianism. That is anti-law. That is, we can go to the other extreme and we can say, well, if, if the law doesn't save us, then the law is unimportant. Therefore, we can do whatever we want to. If we're saved by grace through faith, then can I sin all I want and get all the more grace? Paul deals with that in Romans. And so even as we're talking about being disqualified from legalism, don't go to the opposite extreme and be disqualified from antinomianism. All right, secondly, we notice that we can be disqualified through mysticism, verses 18 and 19. And again, I'll just be honest with you and tell you that verse 18 is a very difficult verse to properly interpret, probably the most uh, problematic in the sense of interpretation in all of this letter. And the reason behind that is what I alluded to earlier. We're only getting one side of the conversation, right? That's why it's so hard. This is like us listening in on a phone conversation, but we, only, we are only getting one side. So in other words, Paul has all this background information from Epaphras about what's going on in Colossae, and he is addressing it through his letter, but his letter is all we've got. And so we're trying to decipher what's going on behind the scenes from this one side of the conversation, and we're reaching conclusions on the basis of that, and oftentimes that conclusion, we're just not quite sure whether it's right or wrong. But here, of course, the issue is mysticism. What does that mean? Well, it appears here that they were encouraging, they were even demanding what it says here as the worship of angels. Now, that's one of the interpretive issues. What, what does that mean? It seems pretty straightforward in your English translations, but that's because an interpretation has already been made. In other words, is he saying that through false humility, we, they decided they weren't worthy enough to worship God, so they worship the angels instead. Or could it be interpreted as not the worship of angels, but the worship with angels of God? That is, in a sense, they wanted to be in the very presence of God in the here and now, not content that that has to wait for a future time. I want to be in the presence of God now, and so I worship with the angels in the presence of of God. Those are the two ways you can take that phrase. Angels, of course, are big business in our day today. Mass merchandising and television shows and all the rest. You'll occasionally hear someone talking about their guardian angel protecting them. And we don't have the time to go into a theology of angels. I did do that one time on a, on a Wednesday night, but we don't have the time this morning. The point here is that they are certainly not worthy of worship. John tried that in Revelation. He fell at the feet of an angel to worship, and the angel said, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Mysticism is the pursuit of a deeper or higher subjective religious experience. Obviously, there is nothing wrong with seeking a, a deeper religious experience. The key here is subjective. That is, it is based on experience and not based on revelation. In other words, the Colossian Christians were in danger of being deceived into believing that their Christian experience was not complete unless they had these subjective experiences. And these kinds of things appear spiritual. But in reality, they move people away from the sufficiency of Christ and the desire for more and more experience. I read this week of a very, very prominent women, woman speaker that is, in the women's ministry of evangelicalism, she is very, very prominent. And she made a statement a few years back, and for whatever reason, it's just now coming out. But she made a statement a few years back uh, comparing the Bible to hand-me-down clothes. She said, you know, when I grew up, I, I had hand-me-down clothes. 
And that was all right for a while. But eventually I got to the point where I wanted clothes of my own. I wanted clothes that had been personally selected for me and had my name on it. And so she went on to say that there ought to come a time in your maturity as a Christian when you don't want the hand-me-down revelation of the Word of God. What you want is new revelation. That's her word, new revelation chosen specifically with your name in mind coming directly from God. Doesn't that sound so spiritual? It does, but it's not spiritual at all. It's heretical, saying that the Bible's not good enough and what we need is newer and more personal revelation. And that's exactly what Paul is dealing with here dealing with people who were encouraging this kinds of, these kinds of things in the local church, adding to their religious life subjective impressions or feelings, and this kind of thing is rampant in churches today. A movement away from the Word of God and the authority of Scripture and the embracing of visions and prophecies and words of knowledge. This comes across in the, in the phrase that you might sometimes use, well, well God told me. And unfortunately, many times when people use that, what they say right after that directly contradicts what, our, what God has already told us in His Word. And the implication is that the revelation that God has given directly to me in these subjective experiences is somehow more important than the Word of God. So God told me, never mind what He told us in the Bible. We need to understand that there is no need for extra biblical revelation because God has given us the complete revelation in his word. And this kind of thing is so dangerous because as Paul says here, it stunts your growth. Detaching yourself from Christ who is the head inevitably leads to a lack of growth. And people who focus on subjective experience as the high of their spiritual life When they come down from that experience, the only thing that's going to satisfy is another experience that's just a step higher than the last one they had. And so it's just going to be one subjective experience after another, all of which is going to serve to stunt your real growth in the Christian life. All right, so we also have to understand that we must beware the opposite. That is, you can be disqualified from through mysticism, But that does not mean that we ought to have a cold and lifeless and dead faith. Yes, we ought to experience God, but we ought to experience Him through His Word. And there's a big difference there. Thirdly, you can be disqualified through asceticism. That word is found in verse 18 and again in verse 23. The idea in verse 18, as I mentioned a moment ago, might be a a false humility, a, a fasting that's designed to promote visions. Not that fasting is wrong, but their motive behind doing it was. But the broader term asceticism means the giving up of things in order to be spiritual. Now again, obviously there are things that we ought to give up. There are some things we are called upon to give up when we follow Jesus Christ. So I'm not saying that just because you have given up something makes you an ascetic. Asceticism merely takes denial to an extreme. In verses 20 through 23, Paul wonders why these believers are considering going back to worldly rules when they've died to these regulations by virtue of their relationship with Christ. And again, that's what we talked about last week. If Christ has set us free from the entangling and the bondage of the law, why would anyone want to return to such slavery? It's mind-boggling. In verse 21, he gives us some examples of these regulations. And then he goes on to say, these things perish with the using and are based on the traditions of men and not the commands of God. And therefore, depriving ourselves of these things blessed by God or severely disciplining our body is no pathway to spiritual life. You are familiar with the man Martin Luther, probably because you know him as the great reformer or one of the great reformers. Perhaps you are even aware of his part in the Reformation in the nailing of his 95 theses to the door of the church some 500 plus years ago. What you may not know is his life before coming to faith in Christ. He was a monk. He lived in a monastery, and he was an ascetic. He thought that asceticism would make him right with God, that he would find peace with God through denial. So he abstained from food, 
He punished his body. He deprived himself of sleep. He exposed himself to the elements by laying unclothed upon the hard monastery floors there in cold Baravia. And through these things, he thought he could enter a right relationship with God. He eventually, of course, discovered that that was not the path to peace with God. It could only be found through faith. But even that extreme could not match a man by the name of Simeon Stylites. He spent the last 36 years of his life sitting on top of a 50-foot pole, hoping that exposing himself to the elements and withdrawing from the world was the pathway to spirituality. Sitting upon a pole for 36 years somehow leads to God. And yet it has no moral value. No, now granted, most of us are in no danger of going to these extremes. In fact, as I'll say in just a moment, most of us in America are in danger of the opposite. That is, in this particular one, most of us in danger are in danger of going the opposite direction, not this one. But there still does exist within the minds of many evangelicals the idea that our performance can somehow gain us acceptance with God, and this is a subtle form of asceticism. Those Christians who believe that they gain the love of God by what they stay away from and what they cling to. Again, all of this being externals. And so they talk about places that you cannot go, people that you cannot be with, and activities that you must not take part in. And again, hear me correctly, there are places you should not go. There are people that you should not spend a lot of time with, and there are things that you ought not to do. But none of those things are going to bring you peace with God. They talk about the clothes you wear, the style of your hair, or the kind of jewelry that you allow. And again, all of these are external things that verse 23b says have no power to change us. Look at that last phrase again. They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That power comes through the indwelling Christ and our relationship with him. It does not come from what we do or do not do. Beware, last week, look out for these people who are going to come and try to lead you astray. Do not be disqualified through their efforts at pushing legalism or mysticism or asceticism. And you say, well, all of this is a bit confusing, so what do I need to do? How do I avoid being disqualified? Well, Paul gives us the key, and it's found in verse 19. Look at that again. He says it in the negative sense, but the key is turning around to the positive. He says of them that they are not holding fast to the head. And so the key for us is to hold fast to the head. The more we abide in Christ, the more we can see the false teaching that is out there for what it is. And the more we abide in Christ, the more we will not be disqualified through these efforts of legalism or mysticism or asceticism, nor will we be pushing that on others looking down our noses at them because they are not as spiritual as we are. Be careful of these things. They are alive and well. They will be on display this week at the Southern Baptist Convention. And they will likely be on display in church after church if we're not careful. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you this morning for the opportunity to study your word and be reminded that these ancient heresies are contemporary reality. The specifics and the details might change, but the philosophy behind them are still very much alive and well. So help us to hold fast to you, our head, so that we are not swayed by anything else or become disqualified because we embrace false teaching. Lord, help us to abide in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing and you respond.